Culture Day in Europe, Augustus the Strong's claim to fame rests on his ownership of the first factory to produce porcelain in the West, rather than on the battles he fought. The disastrous Seven Years' War in Europe 1756 to 1763 heralded the death knell of mice and glory. The factory was ransacked and pillaged by Frederick the Great of Prussia. Throughout this period, Candler, whose originality, fertile imagination, skill, determination and unsurpassed artistic talent had given the factory its greatest success, held the workers together. Following the peace of 1763, the new elector of Saxony, Friedrich Christian, attempted to put his country and the factory back onto its feet. But while they were recovering, other European and English factories were in the ascendancy. Candler died in 1775, and Meissen would never again reign supreme. Its connection to the elector of Saxony was not enough to save the Meissen factory from closure. In France, it had been migrant potters who first introduced tin-glazed earthenware from Spain and Italy. The term faience derived from the Italian town of Faenza, and Italian maiolica techniques are recorded as being generally in use after 1610 in France, when faience was used as an element of architectural decoration and for apothecary jars. From around 1632, potters expanded the industry in centres at Moustiers, Marseille, Rouen and Strasbourg. At Rouen, the French faience maker Edmé Potteret was producing wares during the 1640s. In French ceramic history, he is the potter that's accredited with the invention of France's first soft paste style of porcelain. The French did not use kaolin, the essential ingredient of Chinese hard paste porcelain, which would not be discovered in the ground at France until 1770. While Potteret's wares do not bear a factory mark, the bluish glaze and distinctive decoration used can be attributed to his factory, which continued after his death under his son, Louis' guidance. In 1694, the Comte de Pontchartrain commissioned a report on the manufacture of wares by Louis Potteret and his brother Michel. The report stated, the eldest son makes excellent Dutch faience and porcelain, while his brother Michel and the widow of their father do possess the secret of porcelain but make little use of it, concentrating primarily on faience, but Louis is more skilled at porcelain making than they are. Louis himself declared he dared not make fine porcelain in any but tiny quantities and by his own hand without the assistance of his workers. His death in 1696 had a major effect on continuing production of porcelain at Rouen. During the same period, a faience factory established at saint Cloud in Chantilly was also experimenting and their earliest soft paste products date from the 1690s. Schoena House had visited the factory there in 1701 from Meissen and reported back to Augustus the Strong that none of its products were real porcelain. During the Regence, Louis Henri de Bourbon, who had been exiled from court, purchased outbuildings on the banks of the small river Nonette near his Chateau de Chantilly. In March 1730, he set up a small manufactory to produce porcelain wares. It was quite unlike the hard paste porcelain produced at Meissen. Its body did not contain kaolin deposits, which had not been yet found in France. So what he managed was yet another soft paste variety of porcelain. However, its delightful decoration and useful shapes quickly elevated his factory to success. Louis-Henri de Bourbon was an avid collector of both Chinese and Japanese wares and he guided the initial output at Chantilly. In 1735, Louis XV granted him a patent to produce wares in imitation of the porcelain of Japan. 
His first were covered with a clear tin glaze, like that used for faience, which when fired provided a clean white ground for the restrained use of painted decoration. A French Jesuit missionary attached to the court of the Chinese emperors reveal the ingredients used in porcelain manufacture at Xing De Shen in China in two letters home. The first was in 1712, the second in 1722, and both were published in the public domain by 1735. He confirmed that the main ingredients for hard paste porcelain wares was kaolinite, silica and feldspar elements, all of which occurred naturally in soil and sedimentary rock. In every way, the interpretation of Eastern motives on wares at the factory of Prince Louis-Henri de Bourbon at Chantilly in France were entirely engaging, as were their delightful colour combinations. French painters produced naive figures, and they also had an innate understanding about how space is an important aspect of design. The wares they produced and stamped with the factory mark of the hunting horn are highly sought after today. The prince died in 1740 and quite a number of workers left even though the manufactory was endeavouring to support itself under the guidance of its manager, Siro. However, after his death in 1751, the end of Chantilly and its first period was at hand. The workers loyal to Soro were induced to move and work at Vichen, where the rest of their colleagues had gone. Vichen had been established in 1740 in a disused royal chateau just east of Paris, the city destined to become the main market for its wares. Without the backing of princes and kings in Europe, the early manufacturing of porcelain wares would have been quite impossible. However, across the channel in England, it was an entirely different matter. There, the merchant class was able to capitalise handsomely on the very earliest examples of porcelain manufacture. In 1741, when he was 26 years of age, the French Huguenot silversmith Nicolas Primor had immigrated to England from Liege. He registered his mark at London. It was a cursive letters N and S beneath a star. One of his early financial backers was Sir Edward Faulkner, secretary to the Duke of Cumberland, one of the sons of George II. Spremont was silversmith to Frederick, the Prince of Wales, in a very short time, and many of his pieces are still in the Royal Collection. His enterprise would see the establishment of a factory in the ancient settlement of Chelsea around 1744, where soft paste porcelain wares of immense charm were produced, at the same time as hard paste products were being made at Meissen. Few types of Chelsea painted decoration are more sought after than the scenes from Aesop's Fables attributed to J. H. O'Neill, an Irish painter. Chelsea was a village of about a thousand people, famous for its plant nurseries and market gardens, notably the Physic Garden, the first public botanical garden established in England. It had been founded on land leased from Sir Hans Sloane in 1673 by the Apothecaries Company for the cultivation of useful medicinal herbs and trees. The very earliest botanical painting on English porcelain is that of Chelsea. A wide variety of subjects were used, ranging from exotic flowers to such mundane vegetables as turnips and swedes. Many plants have been attributed to George Errett, a German botanical artist whose works are quite breathtaking. Establishing a commercial factory in a residential area may seem strange to us, however at the time the considerations were mainly those of commercial convenience. Sprimont was the man in the right place at the right time, with a burgeoning interest in producing wares and ornamental pieces with an aura of the Orient. 
His marketing efforts were directed at the rich, the fashionable and the aristocratic. Mrs. Papendick, assistant keeper of the wardrobe to Queen Charlotte, recorded in 1783, our tea and coffee set were of common India China. Our dinner service of earthenware, to which for our rank there was nothing superior. Chelsea porcelain and fine India china being only for the wealthy. Pewter and delftware could also be had, but were considered inferior. The earliest productions are those with the Chelsea triangle mark, an alchemical sign signifying fire, dating between 1744 to 1749 and 50. The very earliest body was notable for its mixture of lead, a tradition that was left over from glass making. This made the wares warm in tone and they only became whiter through the addition of tin oxide to the glaze in later years. The growth of the tea drinking custom in England and Europe during the first 50 years of the 18th century opened up the market for tea wares. One of the most delightful products produced by Chelsea at this time was the goat and bee milk jug. Designed by Spremont, they had fine naturalistic modelling and great sensitivity and restraint in the application of colourful enamels which when fired produced a soft glassy glazed effect so characteristic of early Chelsea. The factory was shut for reorganisation and relocation to a little house on the corner of Lawrence Street and Justice Walk in 1749-50. From this time onward a type classified as the girl in a swing are evident. The paste had changed. It was denser and cooler in appearance with a clear glaze containing a tinge of green. The wares and figures that mark the first output of the works on the Lawrence Street site are marked with a raised anchor and were made between 1750 and 1752. The raised anchor body was both thickly potted and very sturdy, with far less lead and much more lime added. It looks extremely rich, with smoothness and whiteness of whipped cream. This is when the famous Chelsea moons first occur. The moons were air bubbles trapped in the paste when it was mixed before being shaped and they show up when the body is illuminated. They disappear after 1758 and were no longer a feature of Chelsea porcelain. In England at Chelsea, Nicholas Spremont was influenced heavily by the rich ground colours and gilding of the French factory at Vichenne. Ground colours included a particularly beautiful blue known as Mazarin blue. Then there was the yellow, pea green and crimson. These wares with the addition of chasing and chiselled gilding are a hallmark of the gold anchor period. Their quality was unmatched by any other factory at the time. The gilding on gold anchor marked Chelsea porcelain wares is thought to have been applied using an amalgam of gold and mercury, which has been ground finely with a little glass and burnished to a brilliant finish. The most famous example of the use of crimson as a ground colour is a complete tea service in the Victoria and Albert Museum at London. It was bequeathed by Miss Emily Thompson of Dover and is decorated with polychrome chinoiserie style figures playing musical instruments. In an advertisement in the Daily Advertiser of the 12th of March 1759, Spremont begs leave to acquaint the nobility, gentry and others that he intends, the beginning of April next, to sell by auction his entire new productions of the Chelsea Porcelain Factory. By 1765, Spremont's health was deteriorating rapidly, evidenced in a notice issued to the press advertising a sale, positively his last, being unfortunately obliged to on account of his lameness. He sold the factory and ground lease to James Cox, a jeweller and exporter of musical boxes, clocks and automata, on the 15th of August 1769. 
In January 1770, William Dewsbury from Staffordshire, who had been running a factory that decorated porcelain wares and salt glazed stone wares made by others, purchased the lease of the failing Chelsea factory. Together with John Heath of Derby, he produced wares now known as Chelsea Derby porcelain until the closure of the factory in 1784, when the Chelsea tradition established under Nicholas Spremont was effectively diminished. A now famous letter written on the 18th of February 1784 records the destruction of the Lawrence Street factory. I write to inform you how we are pretty forward in the pulling down of the buildings at Chelsea. I think, in a little better than a fortnight, they will all be down to the ground and cleared of the premises, which I shall be glad to my heart, for I am tired of it. <laughs>